Hi everybody, I have with me uh, Prabal Goel, who is a banking and finance lawyer. He's also cleared the resolution professional exam and one of the most knowledgeable people I know on the subject. And he has been uh, researching the fintech industry in depth. He has worked as an in-house counsel, as a senior person in the in-house counsel uh, space, okay, in and in a fintech and BFC earlier. And now he, he he's working in a real estate based uh, company in the financial services area. Okay, he's working in a. You're in a P, uh, NBFC, right? Yeah. No, I'm in a PE fund actually. Yeah. Okay. A PE fund which is focused on real estate investment. That's correct. Yes. Right. So Prabal is. Uh, so today I thought of inviting him to discuss the business model and the premise. And uh, my intention for this session is that as lawyers we have a great challenge in learning about how business works and what are the business interests of somebody in a particular sector of a client. And if we are able to learn that it might be so that we are able to perform legal work better, we may be able to identify new categories of legal work that we need to perform. So today our conversation will not just be on the statutes, the contracts, all of that that's applicable, but actually how does a fintech business model run? There has been a lot of talk on how fintech is making uh, is going to be the future of the legal industry, how uh, fintech promises to off to bring financial services uh, accessible to, wide, to a wider segment of people and how startups in this space are actually gearing up. Sachin Bansal, after he exited from Flipkart, set up uh, a fund called Navi Technologies, a company called Navi Technologies, which actually invests in a lot of fintech, in the fintech space. So, uh, now, this is the background, okay, which is going to tell you that there's a lot of activity happening here. Once in 2018, we had the monetization, which started increasing the move to digital payments, digital technology, and digital work. Now, the COVID lockdown is accelerating that shift. Now, it's important for us at this moment to know how the models, what models the businesses are following, because the way they're going to operate is going to be very different from a conventional brick and mortar business. So that's the context in which I have invited Prabal to speak and share his experiences and uh, and also guide us about some of the business models that fintech companies have. And uh, Prabal, I'm going to ask yeah. you to short sort of start explaining to us, you know, and you can treat us as your students and start explaining to us in your unique style about how uh, a fintech company operates and it can generate money. And you can help us divide and classify the models into different kinds. For oh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, there for the warm I do share a little about your experience in case uh, sure, you sure. want to use. I, I know how much you've said to me about the fact that the biggest opportunity for banking and finance lawyers is in the mm -hmm. fintech space. That's what we've been speaking to each other about in the past week. So it'll be great if you can yeah. share some light on that. Sure, sure. So uh, thanks, Abhire, for the warm welcome. And uh, yeah, I do feel that, uh, you know, so um, just, just a slight uh, clarification. I do feel that while uh, fintech has the greatest uh, opportunities, you know, fintech as a sector has the greatest opportunities for uh, likes of us, uh, banking finance lawyers. I feel that that spot is also shared with, uh, you know, insolvency practice as well. So what, what I see as future of banking and finance are both insolvency practices and uh, banking and, uh, you know, and, and a fintech sector. These, these, are the, these are the two core places where I see most of the banking and finance work uh, originating from in uh, future. Now, what are the reasons for this uh, before I proceed any further? The reason is that, uh, you know, uh, these days, uh, uh, you know, NBFC sector obviously is not as, uh, as obviously seen better days than uh, what it is seeing today. So, you know, the most of the NBFCs, they consider uh, lending high value loans to be full of risk. And uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, shortage of confidence in uh, high ticket size loans has kind of seeped on uh, to the sector as a whole. So even banks for that matter, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, the fear giving loans of higher ticket sizes. So I was having a conversation with somebody who was an ex client. So somebody in one of the largest uh, public sector banks in the country. And he told me that project finance for us means any loan which is more than 10 crores and up to 60 crores. We are not going to lend more than 60 crores. And I'm talking about one of the largest uh, banks in the country. So uh, kind of uh, you could put two and two together and guess who I'm talking about. And uh, the problem with the, 
the problem with uh, you know lending to such you know to bigger corporates and lending large ticket sizes loans is that you know once if you, if you lose out on uh, the loan then the loan then, then you know a whole lot of uh, cash gets burned that probably is not the case with fintech where loan sizes typically tend to be much smaller and uh, thus uh, you know fintech is kind of seeing you know is kind of seeing some kind of you wouldn't call it resurgence you, you would see popular you would say popularity in uh, you know in these times so are you saying that it is uh, increasingly become popular because of the reason that uh, the risk on one person is lesser on one borrower is lesser from one borrower is lesser because your exposure to one entity is lower uh, yeah that's exactly what i was meaning to say so you know so basically sme lending has what has driven fintech models okay so uh, these days if you see i mean if to take some names among uh, the banks uh, the likes of hdfc bank and uh, you know the likes of uh, you know the likes of uh, even rbl and in terms of nbfcs the most successful ones like bajaj finance uh, they are building more of a, of an sme lending book than a corporate lending or real estate lending book and with the onset of covid uh, as i mentioned uh, in particular in one of the lectures in one of the my seminars that i did with the law seco some days back that the labor you know the labor intensive sectors have seen uh, you know have seen something of a you know have seen more setbacks than the other than the other sectors because you see the migrant laborers have left the the bigger towns and bigger cities the metropolitan cities and you know until the risk of covid 19 you know that abates for a, a success a, you know for a successive period of let's say months on end until that happens you won't see the migrant laborers returning with full force back to where they came from so that is also one of the factors behind real estate and uh, you know i personally work in real estate financing myself so real estate financing and uh, project financing will see more of a setback because of this particular reason also uh, covid 19 is uh, you know the outbreak is as you would i guess everybody would agree uh, a sort of an unprecedented unprecedented situation and it has a capacity to alter consumer preferences in the sector so somebody who's you know somebody who's not you know somebody who's ha- who's had his salary cut and which has happened to many of us so would he consider for instance buying a house right now or would he consider investing in let's say investing in gold for instance so you know that is something which uh, you know that is that is that is another aspect which has kind of uh, you know driven uh, the faith of banking sector away from real estate financing because unless people you know professionals like us for instance unless we are going to buy houses the demand for housing is not going to be there and until the demand for housing is not present uh banks and nbfcs would not consider lending to real estate developers the, the likes of real estate developers and uh, you know and you know project uh, developer companies so, hmm. so so if the transaction size one second uh, my voice is echoing back yeah sure, sure if the transaction size reduces then the volume of transactions have to increase yeah that's correct that's Got correct it. and uh, so, you are and one more thing is that if you are lending to smes you are probably taking on a higher risk profile so because smes are more likely to def- default so this is something which is uh, you know which uh, is you know kind of debatable okay because uh, you know because very often i will not hesitate to say this in presence of uh, so many people here that sometimes banking deals are not in fact done on uh, risk profile as much on credibility of the individual mm-hmm. let's take the example of uh, you know let's take the example of kingfisher airlines mm-hmm. now at the time that the loans were lent everybody knew that uh, you know the expansion uh, of uh, of kingfisher were ri- really very very ambitious right and uh, and you know and it was essentially a punt taken on the personal guarantee of mr malia so uh, just one question so what you meant is that more than the data 
for credit worthiness what matters is whether the individual or the entity is has a record of trust and credibility yeah sort of so unfortunately i mean i'll give you i'll relate a personal example and i guess it will kind of resonate with uh, many people who worked in banking and finance so typically in a banking and finance transactions let's say we you know uh, an nbfc is uh, is advancing let's say a loan to the tune of 200 crores to a company to a concern okay is typically backed by a personal guarantee of the promoter of the concern okay how many times have you seen the net worth the net worth certificate of the promoter being uh, you know reflecting an amount of net worth equal to the loan or exceeding it you know ideally if you are trusting an individual to be able to repay the loan in case of default then his net worth ought to exceed the amount of loan but that never happens in fact i have seen cases where the promoter net worth has been as low as say even 25% of the loan being granted loan being advanced so what i am getting at is that sometimes i guess banks take a punt on the credibility of the promoter the the reputation of the promoter rather than you know rather than the the genuine risk profile and uh, you know i guess finance is an industry which is built on relationships over a period of time so what i what i'm saying is that sme in case of sme sme entrepreneurs don't really have uh, that level of uh, i guess they don't enjoy that level of confidence from the bank in in that case uh, i guess the risk profile is uh, the sole determinant of the amount of loan and the terms of loan while in case of uh, you know loans being given to likes of let's say mr vijay malia or you know or their concerns or let's say mr anil ammani or their concerns Uh, in in those cases the entrepreneurs have been able to kind of convince the banks and use their own personal uh, connections within the bank to be able to kind of uh, get softer terms than would have been the case had uh, the credit scoring been completely done on basis of the strength of cash flows or the strength of uh, balance sheet or strength of profit and loss statement of those uh, concerns that's a very very useful point prabhat and uh, for our viewers i have shared a link uh, which prabal had shared with me these this is a list of the companies which are the most prominent and successful in india it's an ing42.com list of the most important fintech companies now this is some one of the methods we use when we research at, for loss equals content development if we want to understand that what is the fintech space in india we're going to look at who are the key players and what they do okay mm-hmm. so there is no conceptual understanding which is coming it is more of a market based understanding these are the top 10 companies which are operating in the fintech space and this is what they do and that's how you can go into deeper into how their operations work and then figure out where they may need legal assistance so you can use this link and uh, prabal that was really a big insight okay uh, about the comparison between data versus past conduct trust and credibility like how the two are differently treated by banks while giving uh, while making a lending decision now one thing uh, i'd want to understand actually i was really curious uh, based on the links of the two startups you shared and i'd love to even screen cast it mm-hmm. on the site to to understand how these business models could operate because it'll be great if we can see a couple of case studies so i can screen cast the website okay and yeah, they, sure. then they can see you had shared with me to robin hood and affirm okay yeah, and correct. we can show them an example of how to actually get into the business model of a company in a greater detail yeah, sure so this is for example affirm and you can let us know what it does sometimes it's not very clear on the website as to what it's doing so feel free because some of them will be seeing this for the first time yeah that's correct yeah so, so this is a fintech startup huh yeah on the face of it doesn't look like right guys it could be any e-commerce startup so how does it work prabal yeah so to begin with a firm is actually not an wholly and solely indian company okay hmm. i mean uh, a firm is definitely you know a great example of uh, you know of a company Uh, which is kind of revi- revolutionizing this uh, space so i'll just i also one second i'll also get to the get to the website 
my uh, desktop is been screen cast so you will be able to see it okay if you want to share from your and you can do no, that no that's all right it's just that okay. uh, i had too many open windows and no that. problem so should i screen share it no, no, that's, all right. that's, that's, all that's all right that's all right i'll be there just uh, stay put i'm just trying to you know uh... see guys this is the site you should be able to see my screen uh, what it's doing is it's offering you various products at a some of these are at a monthly uh, rate one second let me try see like yeah. the air purifier is at a monthly rate the phone is at a monthly rate 84 dollar per month yeah prabal please go ahead i'm going to explore the site as you explain yeah 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 so a firm is basically kind of very new and uh, kind of got founded in uh, somewhere in 2012 uh, 2013 the financial year of 2013 and uh, as uh, you know in i mean some years back there was a there was this uh, you know talk of a firm having gotten a business valuation of uh, you know somewhere between uh, 1.5 to 2 billion so uh, it has it's kind of considered to be a very lucrative business model so what is a firm all about it's basically a fintech business which is uh, you know you know trying to you know it is it is it is again a lending platform it's a lending company rather the credit is kind of given to the consumers okay the credit is given to consumers of let's say electronic equipment or uh, something of that sort you know like you've got a blue solo chair here right yeah so the blue solo chair is being sold by a merchant modern company yeah which seems to be the seller yeah and as firm as an e-commerce interface yeah. and it's probably doing the financing as you were saying yeah so a firm is basically paying directly to the to the to the to the seller of the chair mhm all right okay and uh, yeah and basically basically a firm what it's doing is its real value in giving you the loan Hmm. is uh, your your you know your your basically you while you have to before taking up the offer from a firm you will have to provide lot of data okay so yeah. that it can understand what your credit worthiness is that's correct so what is the, apr annual so i, I th- apr is typically annual uh, you know a- apr is uh, basically uh, how to uh, it's it's a coupon rate okay and uh, so so it's it saying 0% basically full processing rate i think that's okay. uh, the full form of apr okay. in 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 uh, in easier terms it is uh, compound interest being converted to simple interest got it so it's it's called annual percentage rate as a matter of fact i just remembered okay and uh, so basically it is compound rate so for instance if i uh, say for instance if i were to give you a loan of 100 rupees and charge 10% compound interest over 2 years right so it would be 21 rupees over 2 years yeah so in apr, APR terms it would be 10.5 10.5 yeah. yeah so that yeah. is what apr is and uh, the basic so in in and it is similar to how robin hood works as well when we get there okay so so they are charging 0% yeah which means you can pay in installments and not have to pay any interest yeah that's correct but the real interest is not the money the real interest is the data so for a firm it's the data yeah for 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 yeah for a firm it's the data in okay. fact the same for robin hood as well so they are very similar in terms of what they are doing uh huh and so uh, who makes the margins where is the money made how is the money made so the money is being made in data trading as such because that kind of you know if if, if the data is uh, sold to you know to several you know let's say data being sold to somebody you know they can easily track your you know consumer preferences right and uh, they will be able to advertise their products better right likewise uh, you know they will be able to for instance uh, give you the terms they will be able to give you the no, terms. no so let's break it down yeah. suppose i purchase that purple mattress from a firm okay mm-hmm. so a firm will make a full blown down payment to uh, so, the vendor yeah just uh, just uh, sorry to interrupt you abhi there the only yeah. difference between affirm and uh, robin hood yeah. is that affirm is more of a lending institution while affirm is more of a trading platform which is the trading platform which is lending yeah. institution 
yeah so this is this is uh, so robin node is a play trading no it's i mean in fintech you would you know in fintech is basically i mean the definition of fintech is application of financial technology to finance to finance mm -hmm. you know so in in broader fintech uh, you know in broader fintech purview you would consider both robin hood and a firm to be part of fintech right so <laughs> lending if if you were to uh, you know if you were to kind of uh, you know restrict fintech to lending only then yes a, a firm would be a part of it while robin hood would not be a part of it but that's not no, that's fine let's assume both to be a part of it for popular purpose it is right both are yeah, a part yeah. of it. Now okay. the model. Let's see what is the model and the legal work and all of that. First, a consumer when they are purchasing a product, how does it work? I am going to get an uh, a broken down EMI and a firm is saying zero percent APR, so I don't have to pay any additional interest, and I get to break down smaller payments, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever the cost of the product is. Now, as regards with the vendor, what might a firm be doing? Is it paying them the full amount or is it paying them a paying them EMIs too? so we need to see where is the transaction happening where is the buy and sell and where is the le lending part happening because from the front end when i'm purchasing something to a firm that is not becoming very clear and i think that is one of the unique things about the fintech model that we don't know what happens at the back end which is why there is so much volume of regulation about how data is collected how it is used about transparency and also a lot of mm -hmm. times there are contracts which are multi way or and uh, like you will have a contract with one party and not know and you will have to have indemnities regarding other parties involved in the whole bigger picture even though you are not contracting with them so that part no we want to open it up so let's start by organ uh, by analyzing what the model of a firm could be yeah so we did very something very similar with so uh, you would be aware i was employed with dmi finance not very mm -hmm. long mm -hmm. and dmi had a very similar uh, model in that dmi was uh, you know kind of uh, paying uh, the 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 acquisition price to the to the you know the equipment provider the equipment seller mm -hmm. and uh, it was so one second i so down payment was made to the vendor yeah. when a customer purchases yeah so financing is being taken up by the uh, fintech company which is basically yeah. an nbfc hmm. and if a bank is offering these services they tie up with an nbfc to do it no the banks may do it themselves also so they, they can do it direct them okay from doing okay, it themselves so vendor gets and, full uh, money yeah who bears the interest cost yeah. the vendor you know the vendor may be kind of giving them some sort of discount on the smartphone as well i mean when i speak right. of, uh, when i speak of uh, them being hmm. the lender so the vendor yeah. might actually be because you know the 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 nbfc in advertising its lending scheme is also advertising the product yeah so in that sense the so in that sense nbfc is providing a service to the equipment manufacturer equipment seller as well yeah and so nbfc can charge a service charge to the vendor yeah vendor could be like the purple yeah. mattress manufacturing company or the distributor Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, sometimes it can happen that the purple mattress company itself can bear the interest cost because it is, uh, it its sales is increasing, okay, yeah. and it is getting access to an additional uh, buyer. So, if it can cover its margins, then it can also bear the interest. That is one of the options. But here, what you said, trouble in a firm, in the example mm -hmm. of a firm, that that may also not be necessary because mm -hmm. a firm gets a lot of data with which. it can mm. move ahead so it doesn't need to sort of charge the vendor to pay interest mm. on the finance right. itself because the data sort of substitutes an economic value yeah based on the business model calculations of a firm mm. it's the data that is valuable enough which That's means correct. that a firm needs mm. to have valid data collection processes at yeah. the time that a user signs up with the website and this data collection process globally has to take care of the local data protection law which is there yeah. as well as any trans border migrations of data yeah. that is happening in the process of storage and analysis as yeah. well as any banking and finance related regulations that's okay. correct so, so data is being used got it got it prabhat yeah okay. so, and so what one, what one, else, one, yeah. one more question one more thing which i wanted to say is that you know the old adage about cash discount and trade discount hmm so basically because uh, you know another built in protection mechanism is the the concept of cash discount so because uh you know in in this case for instance peloton uh, e-commerce might be getting money upfront itself 
uh, they the, there is an inbuilt cash discount in 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 uh, in the sale and that should also be factored in while uh, you know while so so basically the 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 actual cost price of the equipment has got advertising fee and uh, the cash discount built in already you right know? yeah so that should also be factored in in that even if they don't earn any interest it is possible that a single sale has already insured the the collection of interest already and when i mean and and as and, and in in smaller ticket size loans the interest also tends to be you know you know 1% of 10000 think of something like 1% of 10000 rupees hmm. you know it's only it's only rupees 10 it's only rupees 100 sorry so so you know the uh, you know the interest in itself uh, the the discount in itself tends to kind of substitute for the interest as well so this is typically how you know fintech lending is working as on an nbfc model with equipment providers so this is how in fact in india i mean an uh, an example of uh, you know an uh, a close approximation of a firm in india would be dmi finance doing exact same thing uh, the only difference is that it has only tied up with samsung and it has uh, unlike a firm it's not got a whole whole host of uh, you know distributors and resellers with itself while uh, dmi is only tying up with resellers of samsung or samsung in itself so so as you see you know these uh, these foreign models will uh, you know eventually crowd india so what if a company wants to do this in india how will they be hit by various uh, laws and regulations forget that also what are the kinds of contracts they need to have suppose like a mm-hmm. uh, we don't get want to get into a specific uh, organizations model but let's say like an affirm mm-hmm. type model where uh, okay you are going to be providing let's say laptops okay yeah. hp dell apple any laptops will be financed mm-hmm. by this company mm-hmm. okay something like an affirm which is available in india because people want to purchase good laptops and if they want to purchase this then they can get interest free finance now what are the kinds of documentation it will need to start with that business to even come into existence not not like business incorporation documentation but for mm-hmm. this model what documentation will be required i understand you are speaking of model specific document so you would have uh, you know obviously you would have an agreement by whatever name you call it typically it's called uh, you know partnership agreement I mean, so this will be a standard agreement uh, called like a partnership agreement or a third party whatever vendor agreement which will have which they would like to standardize it uh, ideally a company uh, like an affirm would want to standardize it or if yeah. it's customized also they will standardize it's the customization itself for yeah. different segments of vendors so mobile product mobiles in one way laptops mobiles in another in way, way. Yeah, exactly. exactly if there's a the perishable letter. it'll be another way if there's yeah. an fmcg it'll be another way right yeah you are right uh, that is how it works so you have a service partnership agreement or a partnership agreement okay. uh, and uh, basically they don't tend to you know they don't tend to be negotiated a lot hmm. once you uh, once you settled on a standard because uh, you know in what are the commercial parts that need to be negotiated or understood for example for business yeah. teams yeah so let's say i'll give you an example let's talk about you know samsung tying up with an nbfc okay not taking names again so you know first of all you would have the range of responsibilities as to what can samsung do so for an, for instance is it so basically what what the what the nbfc is probably doing is is outsourcing the data the the kyc collection to the to the you know equipment manufacturer or equipment reseller so in that sense first of all what you have to see as a lawyer yeah i mean i was getting to where dhaneet is pointing yeah whether rbi outsourcing guidelines would apply yes they would i was actually getting there itself for which part of it would the outsourcing guidelines apply so R- if you see rbi outsourcing guidelines all of it actually so as long as you are, so there are certain things which you can't outsource say for instance credit uh, appraisal yeah. right that's not something which you can evaluate because eventually it's your decision to give the loan so you know so that is uh, you know that is something that uh, you know the kyc collection and these you know administerial uh, 
and ministerial uh, you know activities like collection of uh, you know address or collection of and you know do, uh, you know collecting due diligence documents uh, you know ascertaining whether the you know ascertaining the right address of the customer that is something which uh, typically gets uh, outsourced to these uh, equipment manufacturers and and it's very clear and it's very important for lawyers to clearly lay down very clearly lay down what are the responsibilities of the you know of the reseller who's entering into the you know entering into this uh, I mean, yeah. so the reseller is basically or the vendor is getting yeah. more access to customers because cheaper finance is being provided so they are going to benefit from it yeah and the financing company may get interest but is definitely getting data so it's yeah. going to give a lot of cross offers because yeah. it's going to get a lot of customer preference related data over which it could run uh, ai tests they yeah. can anonymize the data also but what yeah. is important is the name of the customer is not important in this case the financial uh, data is not important what is important is the size of the transaction preferences yeah. data about preferences and then to identify trends like if you identify that 100 people who purchase a macbook also purchase an iphone or a oneplus 60 and above that means that the nbfc which is the fintech company can cross sell more expensive phones and will present them more expensive phone, phones on their window okay now that is what they want to be doing they want to be promoting more relevant stuff to you and this is how they get this data and they already have a way of uh, financing those kind of products because they've got all the resellers on board now that's the vision they have when they decide to set this up as a lawyer if you are going to be offering them services then you have to be sort of in sync with them on this kind of a business model that's correct so uh, you know one more uh, you know one one important uh, you know another company is crif yes it is and uh, one more thing that whenever you whenever you analyze any agreement any you know outsourcing agreement you should always see that it is in sync with the rbi directions on outsourcing of uh, services so that is you know you need need to see that is it something which can be outsourced first of all so for instance is it a strategic you know is it something which is so strategic that uh, you know the decision making function uh, you know you know the the the, right. the yeah so so for instance the decision to extend credit cannot be that of the reseller or the vendor yeah and we must also look at why is the outsourcing question so important i think why it's important is because fintech becomes useful only because of scale and scale can be achieved when yeah. some parts of the function are outsourced which is where the outsourcing part comes in because if you are making these services accessible you're going to end up outsourcing some of the functions and while outsourcing you have to identify exactly what list of services can be outsourced and what cannot be if you yeah. look at the rbi guidelines they are not very uh, tight in terms of specifying what can be and what cannot be so there is a call that or a discretion that you need to exercise and when you are exercising that discretion you can only do that when you yourself understand the nature of operations of the business model otherwise what will happen is you will give the rbi guidelines to your client and he will say boss i can't interpret it to apply to my business that's why as a lawyer we need to understand what the what the how the func- business functions and whether it connects to an essential or a core business of a bank or not that's where a value add can be provided by us as lawyers is that is that uh, accurate prabal yeah completely so yes uh, so first thing is that you know while uh, slightly tempering your view on uh, what can be and what cannot be outsourced yeah the technical term is different i think in the guidelines yeah so so what happens is yes rbi guidelines are not very clear as to what cannot be outsourced but they do provide uh, they do sh- throw some light so in in, in yeah. the same principle that, based guidance is there right yeah principle based yeah so for instance according uh, you know sanction so that is not something which can be outsourced to you know to the uh, to the uh, you know the reseller or the vendor and which makes sense as well S- similarly for instance uh, compliance of uh, compliance of actual kyc collected with the kyc norms which are stipulated for nbfc so whether they are sufficient for instance so this is not something which a reseller is equipped to do as well so that is where so that is where uh, you know uh, nbfc has to take up the lead and nb so the the requirement for continuous monitoring 
of whatever is being collected by the uh, reseller or the you know reseller or the vendor is definitely that of nbfc so nbfc cannot really shirk its responsibility that you know we outsource them but uh, you know we are not going to be responsible as to whether the data collected is uh, sufficient or insufficient so it cannot be a case of blind lending so that bit is kind of built in in the uh, nbfc outsourcing guidelines and uh, while uh, yeah but i do tend to agree with you that that guidelines are not very tight and uh, the nbfcs are kind of at ease to evolve there more than that you know i feel that uh, there is a uh, so much innovation happening that if i create an innovative model Mm -hmm. i will frequently end up with a lack of clarity or in the gray with the guidelines so i need a lawyer to interpret a good lawyer who understands business to interpret and give more shape and meaning so that tomorrow right. if rbi initiate something against me i at least have a way to justify or if i have a pr disaster and somebody tries to malign me by saying that i am flouting rbi guidelines left right and center i have a very clear argument to to take to deal with that now that's going to ensure that my business operation is sort of safe uh, that's that's one of the reasons i think that is important yeah to add to uh, what you were saying in fact uh, that kind of also as an is an existential question for an nbfc also because an nbfc cannot have more than 50% of its income as fee income mm -hmm. so the question uh, to the classification of whether something is a fee income or a or a fund based income you know is it arising as interest on loan or is it something that's arising because i'm rendering a service mm -hmm. that is also a very important task for lawyers so fee based income basically from services should be less than 50% and interest should be more correct yes so if a, if a company like our firm looks only at data mm -hmm. and generates money from that it cannot call that interest income that will be service related yeah that will be service related That's so it will have to ensure that it gets 50% or more interest income so somewhere interest will have to be charged for example yeah so if if they continue if they continue with their uh, you know with their operations like this for a number of years while you know under if you if you see the rbi master directions for nbfc every year uh, in the first quarter nbfcs have to pass a resolution that you know they are satisfying all the criteria of what is an nbfc so there is a press release of uh, press release number 8 of 1999 which basically lays down the criteria of being an nbfc one of them is as i mentioned 50% of your income should arise from financial assets and should not be uh, fee based income the other is that 50 at least 50% of your assets should be financial assets okay okay every year yeah so every year internally hmm. uh, since i've been part of many nbfcs in their core team at the at the core level uh, this audit used to be conducted to ascertain whether we were you know to, and we we were the ones who were guiding the secretarial department that you know this resolution can be passed safely so to identify these categories of income what do you need to know you need to know how to read a financial statement and how to read it if these statements are also characterized or i think templates are there from the rbi side it's not a regular income tax or a company that accounting from what i understand it is to be presentation of it and calculation is based on criteria given by rbi yeah that's correct and uh, yes uh, so uh, so yeah basic reading of uh, you know basic reading of financial statements the without having a ca degree is fine huh without having a ca degree is fine 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 i guess uh, if you <laughs> uh, class 11 uh, knowledge in okay in preparation of uh, you know profit and loss account i think that suffices so you don't have to be a cs you don't have to be a ca you don't have to be a qualified resolution professional no. to be able to read this no definitely not okay and in fact even if you were a ca or a cs uh, you know fortunately or unfortunately you would still need to read the agreements because you would yeah. need to pinpoint exactly where is it that this money is coming from yeah so the legal agreements in itself so for instance if if you yourself identified something as a fee income for entering a service and this is where i see the role of lawyers becoming more prominent and you know i have for instance taken my own initiative in my own small way uh, to you know to be able to suggest you know how to allocate consideration so if if you are for instance if you are tying up with uh, if you are tying up with uh, a reseller or a vendor so how is it that you are earning money so be very care be very careful in terms of you know whether it is that they are paying the interest on behalf of the customer or is it that they are paying you fee 
So at certain, you know, you'll have to do that calculation internally and you have to assist your uh, product department in an NBFC to a certain as to, you know, as to, to what extent can you, you know, get away with charging fee. Okay. So if you are a law firm, mostly you will give a broader advisory on this, but if you are internally working in a company, you will actually work with the department very, very closely set up internal guidelines, maybe set up a code of best practices, train the managers, maybe, uh, you know, sit with each team or have one junior counsel in the team to assist with different, to assist different managers. A lot of this can be there. So more yeah. operational work, right? But yeah, a lot of operational work, uh, understanding the operations very well. Uh, typically, however, even if, you know, even if, uh, the product team goes to the, goes to a junior counsel, the sign off will be required by somebody senior hmm. Give, to relate a personal example, uh, in, in the FinTech that I used to work in, uh, which I said, which I took the name of, I was expressly asked my opinion as to how to allocate, you know, the, the fee components. So as to not fall, fall foul of the uh, RBI requirements. So this is something which, uh, you know, this is the, the, you know, this is basic numbers, by the way, uh, you know, I, I kind of get a feeling sometimes that, you know, there are many lawyers who kind of, uh, you know, start getting scared by numbers, but just because of numbers. So these are, you know, simple Got it. to be very so, Okay. So we, we discussed the one standard agreement that is there other than the standard agreement, what else will be there? We should see, and we should also see some of the other major RBI circulars and anything on data protection that, that yeah, we yeah, need yeah. to study. So yeah, which are the other agreements? Yeah. So data protection typically, yes, falls within the purview of uh, what you do as a, is RBI team. doing anything on data protection? Not really. Not really. It's actually, it's uh, even if it does, the problem is that RBI act in itself is not allowing it to, you know, go, you know, hundred percent into the field of data protection. So what RBI is basically trying to do is regulate the credit system in the country. Hmm. Uh, to that extent, whatever is essential for credit system, they, they are def definitely, you know, you know, you're, okay. I, I get the, I get the idea that they are, you know, hmm. uh, you know, they are, they are basically analyzing as to whether KYC norms need an update. And, uh, whether, you know, whether, uh, you know, so whether, you know, RBI should, for instance, interfere in the manner of, in the, in the, in the question of manner of contracting. Got it. Got it. I'll give you an example, uh, back in 2016, a very, you know, well-known NBFC, one of the bigger names in NBFC, they started with an unsecured loan product. So this is basically an unsecured loan to purchase you know, to purchase, uh, you know, let's say something like a house, uh, an affordable house kind of thing in tier two, tier three cities. So it was a pilot project kind of thing. So now the question is that you are not doing it with the stamp papers. You're doing it completely online. So how do you do that? So one remedy, which kind of came up to the NBFC was that, you know, we could, uh, you know, ask those people to transfer a unique sum of money, let's say 76 or 87 rupees to our bank account. And that is what is signifying the communication of acceptance, you know, coupled with the, the e-contract. And, uh, that's how people were doing, you know, a lot of these, uh, lot of these agreements. E-stamping is uh, right now in its very infancy. So I've heard of, uh, some, uh, companies like legality and all, uh, you know, they are venturing into the area of e-stamping. But typically e-stamping is not something that a lot of NBFCs and banks have a lot of faith in. So what they're doing is they are essentially printing the, uh, printing the, uh, the agreement and then, you know, doing it on a stamp paper and later on getting, you know, later on, you know, getting, uh, the signatures of customer when, you know, when somebody is going for a due diligence of the customer later on, you know, post, uh, disbursement. Right. So e-stamping and e-execution are both challenges in this space. Yeah. And uh, for e-execution, you ex explain that e uh, unique number communication. And for yeah. stamping, what people do is sometimes they just buy a physical stamp paper and keep in their records. And they just have to have an index in an Excel sheet mapping which stamp paper was there for which contract. Correct. And and then for just a reminder, they will, cop they will scan that stamp paper and put it in their digital record so that the number matching will be easy. And mm -hmm. so they will have a big pile of physical stamp papers stacked up in their wardrobe. That is one of the ways you can do uh, that yeah. part. But definitely it reduces the ease of operations. But there's no 
other way around it at the moment this is a safe way so that the enforceability part works because enforceability is important in these aspects yeah. because you will go to recover in which in a dit or something you will have to go to recover no or file a civil suit so stamp paper will become important or even do arbitration where this is important yeah the participants who worked in uh, bond uh, transactions they will be familiar with this this is very similar to how a debenture transaction works so even in case of debentures uh, you know what happens is that because i mean these days the idea is generally to do a demat kind of a debenture but the, even then you basically print a physical you know a physical debenture kind of a thing and uh, the stamping is done only once and obviously securities which are dealt in in depositories are not really subject to stamp duty ha to exemption hai bhi fir bhi indian ah. stamp section 8 hmm. capital a mein hai ha ji ha ji yahan security hai nahi so that's hmm. uh, kind of uh, got it. yeah so but however i mean what i'm saying is the 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 concept of printing a physical stamp paper ah. is kind of similar to right right in uh, in fintech models as well got it again i mean another problem that i you know i mean you know in secured loans the problem is that of registration so mm. is in case a loan is secured by mol property how do you how is it that you you know how is it that you uh, are we having this in fintech secured loan no, in fintech not now not just yet are, and and these are unsecured forms of lending right yeah these are until now even if they are secured forms of lending they are if they are if they are even if they are secured they are secured by let's say uh, you know something like uh, a pledge for instance sometimes mm -hmm. case of gold loan financing amni the actual transfer of gold loan. right right hypothetical uh, pledging is and so is this what happens in case of uh, purchase let's say from an affirm or a dmi or something No, not really. In case of uh, DMI, it's purely unsecured. In case of a firm, also it is unsecured. Okay. The the difference uh, between uh, an a firm and a DMI is that a firm works in an environment where uh, e contracts have greater uh, acceptance. Hmm. And uh, DMI works in an environment where the legislators have been kind of slow to wake up to the reality of right. transactions. and i'll i'll give another uh, so the reason i was saying i was talking about uh, security because you know eventually i see you know if more and more fintech companies coming up with this eventually i see that you know in order to broaden the base the lending base you will need some kind of security and uh, so as far as uh, yes mm. let's think like a you know like like a hypothecation or a pledge in case of hypothecation the the problem will be driven by you know section let's say 49 of registration act section 49 48 47 of registration act which is which are very little understood you know i i often ask people you know i in my in, in my earlier days of uh, in my career i used to ask uh, these questions you know they didn't could not make sense to me as to okay you know you have uh, you have hypothecation of uh, you know mobile property and you know this does not need to be registered with uh, with the sub register of assurances in the same way that a immobile property security has to be registered so why is it that uh, you know why is it that you know you are uh, kind of uh, taking it in writing and after pains taking research my my you know my curiosity kind of ended up at you know the registration act so in, in hypothecation of uh, in hypothecation i guess this question becomes even more relevant in case of pledge at least you know you could have something of a, you you can have transfer of uh, the possession of the property and you could give a receipt and thereby save stamp duty and you know i have received this and receipt is stamped the same way receipt is covered the stamp duty on receipt is covered in uh, in the union list so all over india it is rupees 1 uh, you know so so the 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 actual stamp duty has kind of reduced massively with these kind of th th this is how lawyers should work also because you know you would you know you would not be able to for instance you know in 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 these kind of small scale lending even you know 1000 rupees of stamp paper you know if you if you are slightly conservative with stamp duties you know that is where you know it may the the you know the the the, econ, the economic uh, you know considerations will change massively so you give a receipt and stamp it by rupee 1 yeah the receipt in is in case of an hypothecation in case of pledge in case of pledge yeah. okay hypothecation is where this model has not been tested yet okay so till now the only security with which it has successfully worked is pledge but then i can't use the product if it's pledged you can't use the product yeah you can't you as a, as a so that is why it has so i can only do it for something like a gold 
Correct. Correct. So, okay. in case of a gold, what will happen is I purchase one lakh rupees of gold. I don't have that in the bank. The bank find uh, that much money in my bank, so the bank finances it. I take a loan, and then it becomes like a a bet for me that I am thinking that I have to pay the bank ten percent interest, but the value of gold will appreciate by more than that in one year. So that is a way in which a pledge can work, and yeah. a separate inquiry into whether this is a wagering agreement may need to be done. So uh, not necessarily so long as you draft the agreements properly. Okay. So uh, so again, I'll give you an example. I'll also tell you since you've used the term bank. So you know the, for banks, uh, typically you know the problem is that any kind of gold loan, so loan against jewelry. can if it is taken for non agricultural purpose the tenure cannot cannot exceed 12 months so these kind of innovation cannot be driven by banks because they are very mm. little to work with in and and you know the tenure of 12 months starts from the date of sanction mm. so it's not as if that you can have a moratorium and then you can have 12 months so so typically in this so banks way, can't do this basically an nbfc will do it nbfc will charge you more also 10 percent says are they 15 16 uh-huh, percent correct utna hai usse zyada hi hai balki and then the end use for which i use the pledge product will also or the for which i use the loan will be regulated yeah yeah so another interesting factor i think uh, many people might be interested in knowing that an nbfc cannot grant loan against gold coins it can grant loans against jewelry but not gold coins okay clear so that you know you know that uh, you know categorization is also very important so i'll tell you the reason the historical reason behind why nbfcs cannot so typically what happen, used to happen earlier is that many bank used to keep gold in molten form they would actually melt the gold biscuit or uh, gold coins and keep it in molten form and whenever you required it they would give it back uh in case of nbfcs and jewelry obviously as you understand they require a bit of craftsmanship and artisanship uh, so so the artisan value of uh, the jewelry would be destroyed if reduced to molten form so so with the profusion of uh, you know with the profusion of nbfcs uh, you know the idea was that you know you should not be able to uh, be sued for a tort of conversion so this is how rbi typically interferes in uh, in the field of contract and torts by making regulations and uh, you know so full loan uh, intervention may not be possible for rbi but rbi does these kind of things from time to time so 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 for an for a lawyer it is very important to not only check the agreements you know to uh, no, to also check whether the rbi regulations as regards uh, you know lending against jewelry are being followed so uh, i'll give you a gist of what what's required so so the jewelry needs to be assayed you know needs to be valued by an assayer you know some uh, so by a qualified uh, you know somebody who is competent to value it uh, that is important. it's important that the custody of uh, jewelry is kept in security vaults which you know which uh, kind of comply with rbi norms in that respect so that is something where uh, you know the the state of laws is also important the 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 the, the value of uh, you know the value that a lawyer can provide is not only in in the agreement in itself but also in assessing the procedures of the nbfcs and banks got it pratik has asked will it also be because of reducing the loan to value ratio like so, making changes so not sure what it is but loan to value ratio yeah loan to value ratio is typically uh, you know is uh, is obviously restricted by uh, RBI to seventy five percent. So will it also be as in I am not sure what. So if you have hundred rupees of sa- uh, security or uh, asset, then seventy five rupees loan can be given. You can now that. if you use that logic, Pratik, then gold coins you can give because gold coins are a true measure of value. But jewelry, if I give jewelry worth one lakh, the gold inside that may be worth ten thousand. Okay, so RBI will allow lending. For whatever it says, one lakh or seventy-five thousand or seven thousand five hundred or. But what you are saying, Pratik, is that mm-hmm. loan to value will not change because gold coin is the most accurate measure of the value yeah. of the gold. Okay, so that's not the reason RBI has prohibited lending against coins. That is because why Prabal is saying it. Yeah. Now RBI, yeah. So my my guess about RBI uh, prohibiting loan against uh, billion for NBFCs is because they don't want NBFCs to tamper. and nbfcs are obviously you know in times past nbfcs were uh, you know uh, 
used to lesser regulation than banks right and, uh, and by the way it may be you know it may interest our listeners to uh, you know to understand that since 1998 by the way that is when rbi really kind of came down on nbfcs since 1998 and this regulation has increased in last 7 uh, 8 years uh, before that you know anybody started nbfcs you know you know since 1998 for instance there has not been a single uh, deposit taking nbfc which has the license of which has been granted by by rbi why uh because of the volume of regulation yeah because uh, yeah so rbi is of the view that deposit taking is something which is which should be kept to banks hmm. when we say deposits it's i mean let's be very honest deposit doesn't mean deposits by uh, you know companies to uh, it's uh, like an fd ha uh, so deposits uh, so uh, obviously an uh, an nbfc cannot uh, really operate savings deposit or uh, you know something like uh, any deposit which is withdrawable by demand which is you know which is banking function so yes you are right uh, fds is the only product in the deposit space which uh, you know uh, which uh, nbfcs can offer time and demand deposits are not allowed right? no anything anything where you can withdraw on demand no so, so that, let's look at the sequence of regulation uh-huh. then you said nbfc pure play nbfc is one regulated entity mm-hmm. higher level of uh, regulation will be for systemically important nbfc these mm-hmm. are all they have a larger capital base and there may be other criteria but they are non deposit taking highest mm-hmm. level will be for nbfc systemically important and deposit taking which rbi has not granted any one license for we do since not know since 1998 we do not know whether uh, applications were filed or not for that kind of work the applications were filed as a matter of fact you okay. know I to know about it because i was representing a client which was intent on buying some kind, such kind of license okay uh, but that is when i came to when i liaised with uh, when i liaised with uh, the rbi that is when i came to know right repeated uh, you know repeated visits to uh, you know to the bhagat singh road office on on the fort in rbi kind of came to went in vain and that is when we came to know so what i was getting at is that yes you have uh, you know you have this hierarchy broadly that you are you are right i'll just add something to this so microfinance nbfcs also tend to be regulated on the same scale as uh, as uh, non deposit taking but uh, systemically important hmm cmfis okay yeah because uh, because obviously small loan but high regulation yeah the reason is obviously they are kind of uh, dealing with the most vulnerable group of borrowers in the country yeah it is where uh, you know that is where the you know the 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 need for regulation has kind of stemmed it. great okay uh, last question pratik is asking if there are any uh, comparisons to p2p lending yeah so you have uh, p2p platforms in india now uh, interesting question about p2p now you know so there are obviously local money lending laws in india and uh, their application to you know nbfcs right now is kind of uh, uncertain so there are local money lending laws and there are usurious interest loans and all of that that is applicable so how does that work are are, are these nbfcs excluded from such laws or they have to operate in a way that they can exclude like somewhere i think in bombay there maharashtra there is an ex- exception for post credit checks to be provided so that you can then exempt yourself from the money lending laws how does it work yeah so uh, great uh, you know great analogy cs yes, uh, in in certain cases for instance uh, governments have went uh, have gone forward and actually excluded nbfcs from the operation of uh, money lending laws in that state relevant you have to look in the respective state yeah you have to look into okay. respective states and there there was uh, you know coming to think of it there was this radhe developers case mm-hmm. uh, decided by gujarat high court somewhere in 2012 if i'm not mm-hmm. mistaken where you know where uh, uh, gujarat uh, high court stated that uh, money lending laws are not applicable to nbfcs they are applicable to you know individual uh, money lenders you know who you know who are basically doing money lending activities by you know through demand promissory form or bill of exchange okay which which act was considered there this was gujarat gujarat oh. money lenders act so this was gujarat but however at the same time there have been contrary opinions also so in uh, you would recollect maybe abida in 2011 there was huge uh, you know huge controversy re- relating to regulation of money lenders uh, you know there was this uh, they used to be this uh, they used to there is still a company uh, sks microfinance was in you know had enjoyed kind of huge popularity back in the day 
and their operations was stymied to a large extent in andhra pradesh because andhra pradesh government had brought in an ordinance which kind of became an act later on as to regulation of money lending activities in andhra pradesh and yeah. and you know that kind of uh, came in because uh, you know there were reports of uh, you know microfinance companies using recovery agents to recover their loans mm. and microfinance uh, loans are essentially unsecured by law they cannot be secured so the need for recovery agent is understandable even if you consider it unethical it, we can understand why you know a company may have had resorted may have had resort to such kind of extreme measures so you know that that uh, bit of legislation is also necessary to analyze uh, so i'll give you an example in uh, so usurious loans act is basically you know what rate of interest you can charge you know what is it that you cannot exceed yeah to this is central no no usurious loans act also tends to be uh, you know modified by lot of states okay so pre constitutional central legislation but in the concurrent or state list so yeah, concurrent or concurrent list in, in, if i if i am not mistaken it is concurrent list okay idea is that uh, you know the the in so uh, for rbi the consensus in the industry is that rbi regulated industry should be kept away from these two hmm. uh, legislations but uh, we are still awaiting Uh, you know conclusive judgments on these issues so till till the time that we that we've got uh, conclusive judgment on these issues so i mean i'll open this question for a wider forum why is it that only nbfcs if if uh, you know if nbfcs are regulated by uh, usurious loans act or uh, or money lenders act why is it that banks are exempted right you know so in case of banks you have a section 21a in banking regulation act which says that you know the rate of interest is beyond judicial scrutiny but still there is nothing as far as obtaining license or money lending is concerned right so some states for instance don't make an exception for banks also my personal view is that rbi regulated entities should not be touched by these kind of entities but so doesn't rbi prescribe some indicative rates of interest that banks must follow like there's a base rate or a marginal rate over which there's a spread that the banks can charge but is it regulating the cap that's charged or not not uh, not uh, very uh, granular in in very granular fashion so you have mclr uh, you know regime basically which is marginal cost yeah. of lending based fund rate which is basically you know leaving uh, the banks to decide the rate of interest on basis of the rate of interest that they are paying to their to the banks to with that's for the funds that the bank has borrowed us pe yeah. jo interest rate is applicable to bank that's the mclr yeah and spread is left the spread uh, the determination of spread is left to the individual banks completely uh not no not necessarily there are certain determinants which uh, which rbi spe- specified so what is the negative cost of carry on funds that is that would be one of the factors so uh, eventually that but if i charge let's say 20% okay and mclr is 6% rbi would cannot stop me or say rbi would not no Okay. would stop you for the simple reason that uh, you know they realize that if you if you charge yourself out of your competition if you price yourself out of competition you are essentially you know, yeah digging your own grave so that is what rbi has recognized so rbi used to have a base rate regime and prime lending rate regime so prime lending rate was basically what would you charge your best customer and then you know you on on basis of that rate you use a spread uh, taking into account individualized Uh, risk factors for your customers uh, so then there was a base rate regime you know there was a regime in which you could not basically charge beyond a particular point as well you know rbi was regulating the rbi was basically regulating the minimum interest rate that you had to charge got it so that is uh, you know that is something which uh, you know that is something which uh, you know which uh, rbi really lead need you know leaves to the banks or nbfcs to really decide as to what to do how do you do whatever you do right in in i'll in, just make an exception for microfinance nbfc mm. okay, so mm. microfinance nbfcs yeah rbi has uh, you know rbi has a mandate that you know average interest rate that an nbfc mfi charges should not exceed 24% uh how it works is something which is not very clear to me but i i, I what i have seen from my experience of uh, you know having conducted due diligence of lot of these nbfc mfis is that many of these nbfc mfis uh sometimes they don't stick to the actual number of 24% and if they exceed it by let's say 1% rbi doesn't really come down very harshly on them 
only if you exceeded you know massively that is when rbi uh, you know takes the pains to come into the picture okay so on the fintech also i mean there are some uh, you know models which are very very uh, you know i wanted to just say this that uh, you know there are certain models which really are very you know which really require lot of legal intervention you know m- m- some of these are for instance uh, you know some of these are uh, you know you, you have these many of these are invoice discounting kind of models where for instance lawyers have to decide as to whether they should go for uh, something like a you know something like a you know assignment structure or should they go for a bill of exchange structure or should they go for an equitable assignment structure and the law on this is very vast by the way hmm. can you explain the model a little yeah sure 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 so so invoice discounting is basically let's say you know i am uh, let's say i am uh, you know tata motors and uh, i for instance uh, get lot of uh, you know i for instance uh, have to pay lot of my equipment providers lot of money and these equipment providers they get paid you know they submit a bill to me on 1st january let's say and i pay them on an average on by by let's say by 1st march so rather than wait for these uh, 58 59 odd days you know you know for uh, for that period for the intervening period you know some nbfcs are facilitating uh, you know people to kind of lend to the equipment providers on basis of the invoice which has been signed by tata motors which is me and tata motors as you would know are is a very reputable company so if i buy like a so this has to be connected to the tata motors captive nbfc auto finance company or irrespective of that irrespective actually so, so like third party financing is happening so tata motors will have its own financial lending act uh, mm-hmm. subsidiary which is possible or it can have a tie up with banks to sort of co-lend based on independent credit appraisal so or third it case, could be a, a discounting model that you are saying yeah so in this case uh, in, in case of discounting model typically it is not a tata uh, motors which is uh, you know a, kind of entering into any kind of uh, you know straight forward uh, straight jacket uh, agreement with the nbfc uh, with the marketplace the platform provider it would uh, be typically you know so as i was going on so for instance you have this receivable from me and uh, the the crucial question is now this is obviously an actionable claim under transfer of property act as you would de- define under section 3 of transfer of property act so how do you transfer should you transfer it under section 130 of transfer property act if you consider that model then also consider the stamp duty implications and the cost implications of that model as well uh, otherwise you could do an equitable assignment so should you do it you should consider whether for instance uh, the the company would you know whether the hypothecation coupled with power of attorney model if would it, would it work or should you take a straight jacket let's say a pay order or a bill of exchange from tata motors uh in 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 this line obviously there when you when you win something on cost you also lose out on enforceability a bit but that is the that, that is a job of lawyer to understand where is it that you are losing out and where is it that you are winning okay and how is the enforcement done of these loans yeah you said so recovery is, agents couldn't be used shouldn't be used or something so what is the law regarding that you would find it tough to use recovery agents uh, in relation to you know in relation to uh, you know to companies like tata capital for uh, tata motors for instance you, uh, it wouldn't work but in case of uh, you know in case of actionable claim kind of a model uh, you know you would obviously uh, you know in case of uh, you know you would obviously have to resort to a money suit kind of a system in case of bill of exchange i mean that is what i was saying when you lose out on certain you you would have to examine the the, the task of lawyers is to examine what is it that you can use so in case of bill of exchange you have the access to summary suits for instance so if you use a bill of exchange model you would definitely uh, you know you have access to summary suit wherein if tata motors for instance is not uh, coming is is not coming to the court so you've got an ex parte order which is not necessarily appealable so that uh, so that so i'm trying to just give insights you know i'm not trying to give straight jacket solutions because the solutions would differ across geography and across the model of industries but i have given you largely three models of uh, you know invoice discounting uh, system so 
depend i i would urge people who are interested to really really analyze these models you know the models which i said the actionable claim the transfer of actionable claim under section 130 131 of uh, transfer property act the second one is equitable assignment which is basically hypothecation accompanied by uh, a power of attorney and the third one is a bill of exchange model which is essentially you are taking i mean it is like a check which is drawn on tata motors so had tata motors been a bank it would have been a check think of bill of exchange model in such way right so in that case you've got uh, access to summary suits under uh, order 37 of code of civil procedure right so uh, in case of hypothecation uh, i mean no i mean unless you draft the hypothecation agreement very well it may not uh, suffice for the requirement but there is obviously there is obviously uh, you know there are ways to draft hypothecation deeds in the way that uh, would enable you to recover the debt under Uh, you know under uh, order 37 of uh, cpc you could also have something of a pers- something called a personal guarantee model wherein uh, sorry a, a corporate guarantee model or a personal guarantee depending on who is your who is your uh, who to who from whom the money is uh, you know payable so that is also something that you could explore i'm just giving ideas out and f- for instance i was uh, doing this very recently for someone and these are the four models which kind of came to my mind right so these that are, was incredible actually it was huh? really insightful the the form yeah, these are incredible times for lawyers in in terms of if if they really want to get into it and i would you know i mean say for instance i mean uh, you know bill you know so somebody saying bill discounting is decades old i agree with that bill discounting is definitely decades old but the models through which you are discounting the bills that is where you know the models are kind of new and you would have to work in the space keeping in mind the constraints of the sector i mean if eventually if in these four models if these four models don't appeal to you you have the you know the recourse to arbitration but then you should also consider as practicing lawyers the pros and cons of arbitration as well you are in a microfinance or in a 1 lakh rupee loan 50000 rupee loan unless you have effective arbitration online setup with enforcement processes nobody you can't use it नहीं माइक्रो फाइनेंस का सिस्टम बहुत ही अलग है माइक्रो फाइनेंस बट माइक्रो फाइनेंस इन अ स्मॉल यू नो फिनटेक आई एग्री आई एग्री आई एग्री आई बाय फर्नीचर वर्थ 1 लाख रुपीस 1 एंड 1/2 लाख रुपीस व्हाट आर्बिट्रेशन विल आई इज देयर अ स्केलेबल ऑप्शन टू आर्बिट्रेट इन इंडिया व्हिच लीड्स टू एनफोर्सेबिलिटी दैट्स नॉट देयर राइट नाउ नॉट नॉट रियली या सो आई एग्री विद यू सो माय आर्बिट्रेशन इज अनदर यू नो लीगल मॉडल व्हिच यू शुड अप्लाई to these kind but of but once the arbitration act uh, 2019 amendment those provisions for having designated arbitral institutions is notified then there is a chance that this can start working better yeah there is there is uh, yeah so you could do that as well so what i'm saying is that see in case of arbitration uh, the dispute would be between the the lender and the borrower it would be tough to drag you know tata motors type institution to first of all get to agree to this kind of a thing and to also you know to also you know drag them to the arbitral tribunal so so that is that, that is where the the actual limitation of arbitration in these kind of models lie so i mean in 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 the discussion that we did for instance bill of exchange seems to be surprisingly very you know model friendly despite the fact that the actual enforcement i mean you would not have thought of it as a very full proof mechanism got it also you know when when we think of uh, when we think of uh, you know when we think of uh, you know models you should also see lot of these uh, lot of these uh, you know you know stamp acts say for instance in case of stamp acts there are several exemptions for for uh, for uh, assi- for uh, you know assignment of uh, delivery order so you should also you know examine as to whether your 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 receipt or the money you know the 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 document which is evidencing the receipt of money is it a delivery order under stamp act so i mean what i'm saying is that these are you know for, to to be able to analyze uh, these kind of models requires tremendous legal acumen and okay. these, yeah so that is where i see you know i mean bill discounting is one model where i see lot of uh, you know lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, intervention of lawyers coming in 
likewise on peer to peer lending uh, discussions also you know one needs to examine the as i said the 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 individual state acts to be able to come up to a conclusion so what i'm saying is that uh, you know while we can discuss business models uh, you know while the businessmen and entrepreneurs are innovating no doubt about that that should also kind of lead to an increase in innovation in legal uh, options also and that is where i see you know the future of banking and finance i see is in uh, in litigation and dispute resolution more so than proper documentation and uh, so so to give you an example i mean i don't know if it has ever occurred to anybody in if you see the personal insolvency resolution process chapter in uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code effectively it has it will if it if it is uh, you know notified in its current form it will kill the nbfc mfi industry because it allows a person under fresh start process if he's got lesser income than if he is you know eligible for a fresh start process to basically excuse himself out of unsecured debts which are which is what microfinance debts are so even microfinance industry will need to innovate i'm leaving microfinance uh, away from fintech but even even in case of fintech it's very important to see that you know your debt is not something which can be simply excused away as it is the case under the personal insolvency resolution process so my my urge to fellow lawyers and you know practitioners is to not only read the current laws but to also be aware of upcoming laws which are not fully uh, notified because yeah, i think the gray area part always room, leaves a lot of room for advisory on yeah. on innovative models correct it does so in 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 this case for instance if you were to read the law literally it 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 has simply led to you know uh, you know the the murder of uh, nbfc mfi industry you know effectively a person and i hope nobody spreads this idea across that effectively a person can uh, you know simply excuse himself out of unsecured debts uh, so in in case of fintech also you know one would need to be very clear as to uh, you know whether you your your customer is not falling foul of these kind of regulations either so got it is, yeah so there is lot of uh, you know there are lot of uh, you know uh, you know lot of uh, innovation which is uh, you know which should be driven right. by partners in response to the innovation which is uh, you know driven by uh, business so modern businesses require modern solutions right so that is something so for instance these days i was uh, you know you know there are nbfcs which are granting loans to their service providers to be able to you know to uh, you know to say, to basically pay their gst dues and what they are doing is essentially reverting to the contractual set off under indian contract act so what they are saying is basically that if you we are giving you loans to pay off your dues and if you fail to pay your gst dues we will simply not pay your service fees so this is another model which is coming up and it had it has its recourse in the old laws itself right got it the contractual uh, set of uh, provisions under section 170 and 171 172 under indian contract act they are driving the recourse of these nbfcs also so there's tremendous lot that uh, lawyers can do with uh, you know the, the application of law you, uh, one would need to read indian contract act and uh, you know the rbi regulations and uh, you know insolvency and bankruptcy code and the companies act and other uh, you know constitution based uh, laws in tandem to really really understand these uh, you know the interaction of these laws and as to how lawyers can add value i personally feel that you know if you are not if you if there is always something to innovate here and if you are not being able to add that that means that you are you have simply not read it closely enough right so we'll be inviting prabal to take additional sessions on de in detail on each of these models in the fintech course and in the in the technology laws diploma and in the banking and finance laws course which has been recently launched where he will give we will have exercises to perform uh, on each of these models so that we can understand this in depth there are already a lot of chapters in the technology laws diploma on the fintech model and yeah. so those of you who are interested in learning more can reach out to me uh, or anybody from our team uh, in from the lawsico team to inquire further about how you can go forward and build a career in this sector now the thing is that because there are so many things as you heard, heard prabal speak there are so many laws which are 
interconnecting with each other from contract act to stamp duty law registration related law state legislations uh, and technology laws rbi's framework everything is interconnecting contract law is interconnecting to lead to the you know to and these are all required by lawyers to serve on so your classical understanding that i do x work i am a stamp duty expert i am an mna expert and i know mna related stamp duty matters that won't work when you sort of start try to get into a new industry so you have to keep that in mind and uh, that's what the sector is going to require us to do as lawyers and as we just i'm just rounding this up we heard that there are massive opportunities in in-house roles and as well as in lending uh, entities in, in legal team roles also i also see a lot of uh, you know law firms kind of intervening intervening in these kind of uh, uh, in these kind in this sector also the, right. the i'm sorry for interrupting you over there the no problem is that uh, you know so many of these uh, fintech you know some of these startup uh, startup fintechs cannot afford in house lawyers so they basically what they are doing is they are basically taking lot of uh, you know practitioners on on their on on retainership kind of roles so i know somebody who is for instance serving four fintechs at the same time with similar uh, business models right so, so if you develop expertise in this area then you can start having other clients mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so what is what they are doing is they are, that person is also economizing on his time because he is basically hmm. doing the same thing over and over again, and thereby he is also being able to you know develop his expertise to the to the uh, to the level where you know he is he is a fintech expert these days. Yeah. So if you want to move out of law into a purely business role, also this is a good idea to explore. Yeah. Guess, yeah. Sure. Okay. So I want to thank Prabal for his time. We've had a long session, it's ninety minutes. uh and uh, i look forward to hearing your feedback from all of you you can let me know on chat how you found the session i think we started with about 100 people we have 55 here now so uh, let me know guys how the session was let us know by through your public feedback let us know on the whatsapp group also keep recommending topics to us i know a lot of you have messaged me uh, personally about what you all want so let us know on the whatsapp groups because our entire team is working very hard on bringing the best webinars from the most experienced experts to you so we will keep those in mind let us know your feedback and then we log off today okay thank you everybody and thank you prabal for your time we are extremely grateful to you no thanks thanks abhire uh, also for this opportunity and uh, i guess it was nice uh, reading it's nice reading lot of these comments on uh, zoom group chat also it was kind of heartwarming mr shivam tiwari there you ah. put in some of those uh, emojis there so kind of uh, nice there as well i kind of sometimes got distracted by the chat also because <laughs> uh, you know there was uh, there was i mean i was getting some cues from the chat to speak on but sometimes you know you don't you sometimes you have so much to speak on that you can't decide in your head as to what what you correct correct you know. that's the nature of this space so if we do this sec- uh, session five times then we will know exactly what all to sort yeah, of map so. where to stop what to branch out into so yeah i guess so okay. Thanks thanks. All right thank you everybody. See you bye.